Welcome, everybody. So I'd like to start by acknowledging that we are on the unceded territory of the Cowichan people, and that today is um, Indigenous Day. There was a lot of things happening all over, well, all over Canada today. Um, I've seen lots of events online, was at a few in person, and it's been in a pretty incredible day. And with that, oh, are we okay? I just heard, we're okay? All right. So in this room, there are different views, different ways of expression, different emotional intensities, and different roads that lead to conclusions. May we combine clarity of mind with kindness of heart, and may we be impartial without bending to strong personalities. May we sacrifice self-interest for the good of the whole, and may we do our work with love and clarity of vision for the benefit of those who we represent. So good evening, everyone. On this balmy June 21st, it's also solstice today, and it is very warm <laughs> everywhere. So I'll call the meeting to order and we are still using a Zoom platform and you can find all of our meetings on YouTube by searching the city of Duncan. Are there any late items, Ms. Shittick? Yes, Staples, I do have two late items. We have an attachment uh, G and H for responses to public notice. 545 and they have been attached to the agenda. Okay, thank you. So approval of agenda as circulated with late items attached. I have a mover and a seconder. Any discussion? All those in favor? Any opposed? Motion carries. Adoption of minutes from the June 7, 2021 regular council that the minutes of June 7th be adopted as circulated. Do I have a mover and a seconder? Any discussion? All those in favor? Oh, yes. Go ahead, Ms. Shittick. Um, Mayor Staples, I have um, resolution 7.81C and appendix C have been updated on the agenda. As to the motion that was listed, there is a variation on 3.32.1 is changed to 3.32.4. On the agenda, is that correct? Or in the minutes? We're on the, we're, we're, we were on the minutes right now. So were you speaking to the minutes or to the agenda? I apologize. I was speaking to the agenda. Okay, so we'd already moved those with the adoption of late items, but that sounds like there's just some things that have moved around. So that's okay. All right. I apologize. Yes, that's okay. So um, adoption of minutes, uh, June 7th. All those in favor? Any opposed? Motion carries. And we'll move on to our delegations. And we have Rob Fisher and Christy Fairholm. Mater from Coastal Community Social Procurement Initiative Implementation. That is a mouthful. Welcome this evening. Good evening. Um, joining you from unceded Lekwungen territories. Uh, unfortunately, Christy Fairholm Mater's sister has just had a baby, and so it's just me yeah. you're stuck with this evening. <laughs> well, that's exciting. Not, not necessarily being stuck with you, but that she <laughs> had a baby, but it's wonderful that you're here too. <laughs> so welcome. And... Uh, Yes, the floor is over to you. All right, I'm just gonna share my screen here. Just give me a thumbs up if you can see that. Mm -hmm. So fabulous. Um, good evening, uh, Mayor Staples and Council Members. I'm Rob Fisher. I'm the Program Coordinator for the British Columbia Social Procurement Initiative. Uh, great pleasure to be here with you this evening and to present on BCSPI member benefits and social procurement opportunities for the city of Duncan. Uh, and if you hadn't heard, we just moved into phase two of the program, originally called the Coastal Community Social Procurement Initiative, with support from the BC provincial government to expand province wide. And that's something we're really excited about. So be mindful of everyone's time. I'll try my best to keep this presentation to around 10 minutes and hopefully we'll get some time at the end for questions. 
And during this presentation, we'll cover social procurement, what, why, and what's possible. And we'll take a look at some of the member resources the City of Duncan can utilize to begin to work towards implementation. So we'll start with the what and why social procurement. And as you can see from this visual, social procurement is a new concept. And those practicing this new way of purchasing are doing some fairly groundbreaking work. We're changing the fundamental culture of traditional procurement. It was only in the 60s that we start to consider green in our purchasing. And only in 2018, just three years ago, that we started to look at how we could get additional social value from everyday purchasing. And simply put, social procurement is leveraging a social value from existing procurement. It represents a shift from lowest price to best value. It means adding a social value to existing purchasing in order to create a whole community approach to value that complements the normal purchaser and supplier value that's already created by any transaction. So why should we start implementing social procurement practices? Well, as we know, every purchase has an economic, environmental and social impact, whether that's intended or not. And social procurement is about capturing those impacts and seeking to make intentional positive contributions to both the local economy and the overall vibrancy of the community. So what's possible? To break down the sheer potential of social procurement in Canada, governments alone spend billions each year procuring goods and services. When you consider the total expenditures each year by federal, provincial, municipal governments and large institutional purchases like health authorities, universities and school boards, this is a tremendous amount of purchasing power we can leverage to create more value for society while still creating economic value. And social procurement also represents a key tool in the COVID-19 recovery toolbox. Uh, for one, in the short term, social procurement practices can help create opportunities for small local businesses that serve the community and provide employment opportunities for local people. On a broader scale, your social procurement objectives can connect with your strategic planning objectives, connecting your purchasing to your local social and economic development needs. The key opportunity areas normally found around social procurement are for employment, skills and training, social value in the supply chain and community development. As I mentioned, social procurement objectives can be connected to strategic planning goals. When we look at the social procurement for the city of Duncan, it could potentially support these goals. And one of the main questions that comes up around social procurement is, is it legal? What about the trade agreements? Yes, it is legal, trade agreements do apply. Essentially, you can't restrict competition, but what you can do is require community outcomes from all bidders on your competitive bid processes. Trade agreements also have exceptions for contracting with nonprofits and people with disabilities, as well as others. And trade agreements have financial thresholds, which you can work within. Another big question that comes up around social procurement is does it cost more? And we found no evidence to support this. Uh, in some cases, it costs less to use local suppliers. There are two main avenues when we look at social procurement, and one is through the social purchasing of goods and services, the other is through community benefit agreements. And the purchasing of goods and services is the everyday acquisition of items you currently purchase for your operations, uh, other regular business operations, including office supplies, catering, cleaning, printing, couriers, all these kind of things. And then community, community benefit agreements are predetermined and defined social outcomes that will be delivered as part of a major infrastructure, land development or construction project. So when we look at implementation options, um, these are some of the things that we would look at right off the bat and things that you can start to begin to do. And this is when we look at under threshold and direct award purchasing for those municipal thresholds and for the trade agreement thresholds gives you discretion in what you do. Um, adding social value weighting into your competitive bid processes. We talk about unbundling of larger contracts. For example, if you have a construction project, you can unbundle some of that larger project to make room for local suppliers who can come in and do some of that work. We talked about community benefit agreements and we also can look at um, contractors existing supply chains and we can do supplier engagement and vendor training. So what is this great initiative that the city of Duncan has recently joined? The British Columbia Social Procurement Initiative is on a mission to improve the health of our communities and the strength of our economies by changing the culture of public sector procurement. How do we do that? We help local governments and institutional purchasers across BC to turn their procurement dollars into achievable and measurable community benefits. As you can see, we've got a wide variety of members and most of these are based in the uh, Vancouver Island and coastal communities region as they're the original CCSPI members. That was 29 participating governments and organizations with 200 individual staff members, whether it be at political level, senior team or actual procurement professionals. 
And that's seen in the first two years, $200 million of social procurement spend in the region across over 50 pilot projects. The team's made up of some social procurement and social impact experts, starting with Bisocial Canada, the National Advocate for Social Enterprise and Social Procurement in Canada, Presentations Plus, Supply Chain Experts, Scale Collaborative, Social Impact Experts, and the Vancouver Island Construction Association, a liaison between um, the construction industry and social procurement. BCSPI member resources, that is, this is what anyone that's onboarded and there is no limit to folks that can be onboarded um, within your procurement and your staff. So what you see here is the member homepage. We have access to best practice examples, templates and guides, consultation, training, webinar libraries, the list goes on. We also have a community of practice and impact measurement and supply outreach tools. When we look at a typical BCSPI member journey, we start at number one where we sign up and we work through to implementation within pilot projects, lessons learned. And once we get to implementation in all of our projects, we get update our policy and then we move to impact measurement and supplier outreach. So I've already done a check-in with Bernice and it's great to see Bernice on the call. And we know that the next stage for the city of Duncan is some staff training. But the great news is you've already got a social procurement policy, which is a fantastic baseline to ensure social procurement begins to be included in all your purchasing as we move forward. And so we've talked about training sessions. There's gonna be the introduction to social procurement, implementation of social procurement, implementation of social procurement in construction projects, and a ton of subject specific webinars to get started. Members also get access to a ton of templates and guides. Consultation and support services, which is one-to-one -one consultation, project review, policy development, uh, criteria review, troubleshooting and evaluation, and a ton more. And we also have a community of practice, as I mentioned, which runs bi-monthly, and that allows procurement staff and implementers to connect at that level, learn about what each other are doing, what kind of successes we're seeing, and to stay up to date on all the resources and tools. And that's pretty much it. So thank you very much. And um, I'll open up for some questions. Excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, questions from Council. Councillor Newington, go ahead. Thank you for your um, presentation. It's very interesting. Um, can you tell me, have we used your services and, and how were they applied um, to the city of Duncan? All right. Well, Duncan's a brand new member and we're really excited oh. to have you on board. Um, and Bernice is, is on the call, is the lead, and, and me and Bernice have already had a check-in and kind of planned out a strategic journey towards starting to implement social procurement. As you know, you have it in your policy, um, but really staff need to be trained around how to start to implement it to do this properly, and that's going to be the next step. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Councillor Brooke. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, thank you for your presentation. I'm just wondering who is currently using uh, the, the services you're providing. I'm really just getting at, are there, are there references we can look and see how things are going from another municipality? Absolutely. And uh, you saw in that brief presentation that there were a bunch of examples and best practices. And those are pretty much all from existing members. Well, and, and many from this region since um, CCSPI was solely based on Vancouver Island in the coastal communities. So even on the website, if you go to the about page, there's five case studies you can check out. It's the city of Victoria, Comox Valley Regional District, District of Tofino and Port Hardy. So a really nice variety of sizes of uh, different types of community. And you can see some of the, the, the things that people are doing already. And as I mentioned, you know, we've seen over 50 pilot projects. All of those uh, RFPs and whatever other documents went along with those projects are all available in the back end for your staff to check out. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any other questions from council? Seeing no hands over there. Thank you so much for your presentation. Much appreciated. And for all the work that you have done on this, it's been a long journey getting to this stage and just much appreciated. Thank you. Thank you all and you know, really looking forward to working with the city on Dun of Duncan on this. Thanks mm -hmm. again. Excellent, take care and have a good night. And our next delegation, we have Judy Mills and Barry or Reardon from the Economic Development Division for the annual activities update and sub-regional support presentation. So welcome. Thanks so much. I'm just going to share my screen. 
That's okay. Just give me one second here. Okay, you seeing my presentation? Great. So, okay, so here are the topics we will cover today. So, first, we'll recap on the context of the EDC work plan, the Economic Development Catch and Work Plan. Next, we'll have a look at the broader economic landscape within Cowichan, and then I'll provide an update on EDC activities. At EDC, our work is guided by both the EDC strategic plan and the CDRD corporate strategic plan. We look to in, embed reconcili reconciliation with Indigenous peace, uh, peoples and to respond to climate change in all our work. And importantly, we seek to have our work informed by data. As we look at the regional economy a little closer, what can we see in 2021? First, we see a region that's well positioned for trade. DP World recently signed a 50 year lease to exp expand the Nanaimo's Duke Point terminal to increase global uh, shipping options. They provide a barred service to mainland BC's deep sea port and have a container shipping capacity for direct international shipments. We're experiencing constrained industrial capacity particularly for service industrial land as identified in, industrial, in the industrial land use strategy. OCP reviews are taking these concerns into consideration and some industrial lands has been opened up, particularly by First Nations, but the lack of lands continues to be constrained on business investments. Catch in the face is facing a housing shortage, a construction boom and several major infrastructure projects are in the works. Kachin District Hospital at 887 million, Kachin School Replacement Project, High School Replacement Project at 82 million, and North Kachin Duncan RCP, RCMP Detachment at 49 million. These projects may encourage more inward investment and also put pressure on the labor market. With COVID, businesses are still facing uncertainty and may be set for somewhat bumpy recovery, dealing with legacy issues from the pandemic. Overall, Business recovery is looking fairly favorable within the region. Trends emerging from COVID include a move towards remote work, uh, more diverse, uh, densified densification in our urban cores, and an acceleration of technologies, uh, role technology is playing in our lives, and an interest in shifting to a circular and regenerative economy. This slide just serves to illustrate that Kachin has a broadly diverse economy as well as a growing technology sector. On the left here, you'll see that the total number of businesses in Kachin has uh, remained relatively unchanged over the pandemic, although there has been winners and losers. In terms of employment, you can see here that we're, we're doing better than 2020, but still lagging behind 2019. EI claims in Couchin remain high around 3,400 versus uh, 1,500 in 2019. The reports from businesses having difficulty finding work, especially minimum wage workers and service industry positions. Housing. Benchmark housing prices in Couchin have seen significant increases, increasing almost 20% in just one year, accelerating the regional housing crisis. The British Columbia Real Estate Association reports that it would take approximately 2,500 new listings in this area to create a balanced housing market in the current conditions. They continue to advocate that we need to speed up the development processes so that municipalities can expand supply more quickly to meet demand. For a more comprehensive look at the regional economy, please refer to the Catch and Recovery Dashboard, which is available on the uh, Economic Development Couch and website. And there's a mailing list there too, so I'd encourage anyone to, to sign up to that for, for future updates. Moving into EDC activities, I'd never provide a brief overview of the activities, EDC activities as they relate to the EDC strategic plan. Firstly, business retention, attraction, expansion, to which we add response, recovery, and resilience. Here, 
EDC support continues to support a buy local campaign, which was initiated in 2020 by a group comprised of regional business support organizations. While this program has been scaled back in 2021 uh, with these groups refocusing on their core work, the relationships built during this time have, will have be the enduring legacy of the project. Wrapping up just this July is the Couch and Food Innovation Program. So EDC partnered with uh, Spring Activator on this project to provide opportunities for existing food business to pivot um, in COVID and new entrepreneurs to, to expand and to uh, advance their business opportunities. In 2020 and 2021, EDC provided free licensing opportunities for couch and businesses through the Island Good brand. On industrial land, EDC has been working behind the scenes to support investment decisions around the use of industrial land and, continue, and also contributing to OCP processes. Earlier this year, EDC parted, partnered with Project Zero and the Duncan Couch and Chamber of Commerce to hold a circular economy lunch and learn, and more activities are planned around this in the fall. ED is also supporting inward investment into the region, for example, by hosting a virtual couch and tour uh, to BC USA trade investment reps in May last. Within agriculture, so following up on a food processing feasibility study that we completed in uh, 2020, the dream of a couch and food hub came solidified at the end of 2020 when the province supported a CBRD application for funding of a couch and food hub for the couch and green community we'll build. It was very, very exciting news. The CBRD has been supporting BC land matching programs since 2018 and has recently renewed that commitment for another three years. EDC staff are also sitting on the BC Climate Agriculture Initiative on Vancouver Island, over their oversight committee. And we contributed uh, 10,000 in funding for a crop trials project to take place on Vancouver Island over the next two years, also sit sitting on those committees. We've been supporting the Island Ag Show, uh, which was postponed in 2021, and we're hopeful that it will return to the island, um, hopefully catch in 2022. Speaking of the Ag Show, uh, in 2020, workshops were held to better understand the potential contribution of cannabis to agriculture. This year, EDC is digging a little deeper to gain a better understanding of the role cannabis is playing in both the legal and gray market within Couchin. And looking forward, EDC is looking to embark on the first steps of a Couchin food security strategy in 2022. Moving on to tech, EDC continues to act on the recommendations coming out of the Couch and Tech strategy. In 2020, we promoted the Innovation Island DER3 program, which uh, supported companies wanting to move into the digital economy as a result of COVID-19. Um, last November, we hosted, again with Innovation Island, a, a workshop series, um, a speaker and workshop series called Couch and Talks Tech to support innovation tech companies and to provide a glimpse of what tech, um, where tech may be taking us in the next few years. Tech jobs are well paid. To support lo local employment in the sector, EDC has been working with VIU, Couchin, SD79, Couchin Tribes and Industry to develop a Maven Couchin tech training program. So once it's completed, uh, we're just getting it wrapped up right now, then the next stage will be to to advocate and look to get that program established within Couchin to provide homegrown jobs in tech. Also recognizing that tech sector development in some cases is best done at the Vancouver Island scale. We're collaborating with other regions with on Vancouver Island in the phase two of a Vancouver Island tech attraction project called techisland.io. So check out that website uh, if you wish. And that the current phase of the project is to attract to, uh, global tech companies to Vancouver Island. Of course, key to having a tech enabled society is having um, accessible high speed internet. EDC is gearing up to undertake a catch and connectivity strategy in 2021 to help build a roadmap for better connectivity for the region. And then looking forward, we continue to, to support uh, tech innovation in Couchin. 
On film, the Captain Film Coordinator is working to attract film productions on the island and to provide a seamless service for production filming here. The film industry continues to play an important economic development role within, with production still uh, taking place safely during the pandemic. This past year, some notable productions include Resident Alien Lady Smith and Super Pops and Duncan. To support film around the region, EDC is looking to update our Couch and Film Bank this year, including developing me media assets over towns and villages. You may know that uh, Malahat Nation continues to work towards the development of an ambitious project, which is a Malahat film studio complex. This project is progressing with feasibility studies scheduled for completion this year. If built, the studio complex would be a major economic driver for the region. As for tourism, with BC entering the phase two of the restart plan, tourism opportunities are opening up and the industry is looking to recover. EDC continues to sit on the board of Tourism Couchin and Tourism Couchin is now supported by Tourism Vancouver Island to deliver tourism services to the region. And they bring a lot of firepower with that. Along with that, the MRDT, the Municipal District and Regional District Tax is due for renewal later this year. And uh, EDC sees sports tourism as a major growth opportunity for, for tourism. Lastly, but not least, sub-regional support. We recognize that towns and village cores have been impacted in different ways by COVID and that their vitality is key to the economic vitality of the whole region, as well as response to, to climate change, think the densification. Economic Development Kitchen was successful in a grant funding application to the Island Coastal Economic Trust uh, Community Recovery Program to support the hiring of a part-time economic development analyst for up to one year. And this hiring process is underway and will be uh, finished fairly soon. And we're looking to support towns and villages across, across the region with recovery. And that, that's the end of my presentation. So I welcome any questions. Sorry for going a bit over time there. You're muted. Sorry, can you just unscreen your, or unshare oh. your screen, sorry, so that yes. I can see everyone? Thank you. There you go. I see Councillor Duncan. Oh, thank you, Madam Mayor. And uh, thank you for the update on the information. I have a couple of things. Uh, on the connectivity, I'm really glad to hear that you're gonna uh, undertake trying to push the uh, t connectivity because I know that TELUS spent up to $28 million in this valley and it seems like they forgot to do the marketing part after installing all this. So perhaps you might want to touch base with them and, and get some sort of dual marketing going. Um, I also heard you say that you had worked with the chamber and uh, and with Tourism Couch and, and you know I've had some concerns for quite a few years around funding for the visitor center. And, um, you know, Duncan is the small partner. We don't have a bunch of taxpayers, but um, Tourism Couchin does get significant funds. So I'm wondering if you're the EDC would undertake funding the visitor center. My, my understanding of that whole process, and thanks for the question, is that there would be need to creation of a new service within the CDRD if uh, the Ketchum Valley Regional District were to will to support the visitor centers as it's not covered under the existing service agreement. So yeah, that would be the process. I think that's a pretty lengthy process, but that, that would be the, the process to undertake to do it. Yeah. So just you. as a, a follow-up, it, it is yep. a regional uh, center and uh, you, you're the regional government. So I would really like to see the regional government start funding the regional visitor center because it's for the whole region. So uh, I hope that uh, perhaps you may champion that cause for us because we have to review our funding every year. And uh, I see some dark clouds on the horizon for us around funding. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, <clears throat> Councillor Bruce. Thank you, Mayor Staples. Um, uh, Barry, when, if, if, uh, I'm sort of new to this a little bit, but if if you were to hear of a business that is wanting to re relocate or locate here on Vancouver Island or indeed in Duncan, would you then, do you then jump in and uh, try and help them procure a location? I mean, do you get, 
uh, right down into that kind of thing for them and with them? Does, is that part of your mandate? It would it'd probably depend on the, the level of business that it was in terms of who they're coming, what they're doing. But we definitely would would be happy to hear from them and we'd be able to either direct them towards resources or we'd be able to find information that's relevant for them to support their decision to move here. We have a lot of information directly on our website as it is that can provide information to, to guide folks in terms of local resources. But we'd also be able to, if they're looking for land, we could put them in touch with right realtors. If they're looking for land that isn't available, maybe we could you know, try to find if there's any local knowledge that can direct them that way too. Um, so we we have a good idea of what you know what's happening within the region. So we'd be able to provide a lot of support that way. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions from council? I don't see any other hands over on the screen. So thank you very much, Mr. Reardon. Good to hear from you and all the work that um, that you've been doing during COVID with with everyone to support them has been incredible. Thank you. Thanks so much and have a great evening. You too. And so with that, we'll move on to 6.1, the report of the Chief Administrative Officer. Over to you, Mr. Divertai. Thank you, Mayor Staples. Um, well, we're very pleased to welcome our new uh, Public Works Operations Manager, Nath Nat Natalie Bio. Um, that's spelled uh, B-I-A-U. And um, yeah, great, great to have her on board. She just started on uh, last Monday, June 14th. So uh, Brian's very thankful to have uh, some, some help on board again after doing double duty for a little, little period of time. And we're all excited to have her on board. Um, the City Hall office spaces renovations are in the final stages uh, for the new office space and the updated uh, counselor's office upstairs. Uh, renovations have begun on the main floor as well, which will create uh, two office spaces out of what was uh, one previous office. A couple of other updates. The Duncan Housing Society has recently received a confirmation of funding approval from BC Housing for their newly proposed independent living facility and anticipates submitting a rezoning application and commencing public consultation uh, in this summer and on its uh, proposed concept. In addition to the society's own consultation uh, with, the, with the public and the neighborhood, there will be multiple opportunities for public feedback directly to the city uh, on the proposed redevelopment and the land swap and, and all that goes along with that process as, the, as that process uh, progresses. The uh, McAdam and Rotary Parks plan are on uh, the final phase of feedback being incorporated into the draft is now on tonight's agenda for adoption. Uh, I think everybody has probably seen by now the new tables uh, in the 85 Station Street Park are, are uh, set up and the outdoor temporary food court is, is all installed and looks terrific. Lots of uh, positive feedback about that so far. The OCP uh, plan, the advisory committee was appointed and met on May 26th. Please speak uh, page is, is up and uh, as is the public survey. And a pop-up event uh, was held at the Dunkin' Farmers Market uh, just this past Saturday on June 19th. There are still uh, $54,000 approximately in uh, the city's uh, program of COVID-19 grants. Uh, grant applications are still being considered on a first come first serve basis. So if uh, anyone wants to look into that, the information's on the city's website. The situation table, the par table participants began their online learning on June 7th. Uh, trainings approximately 10 to 12 hours spread over two to three weeks. And the ongoing commitment of uh, each individual within the group is approximately 90 minutes a week for meetings, plus whatever necessary uh, interventions or, or uh, consultations they might become directly involved with. Uh, tax notices have been mailed uh, and the deadline uh, or due date, I should say, is uh, fast approaching. Uh, that's uh, the end of the month, uh, July uh, 2nd is the due date. Uh, of course, council did uh, approve an extension to the penalty date uh, for a second year in a row, 
And so uh, while due date is uh, July 2nd, we encourage people to pay uh, by that due date, but penalties are not applied until September 30th. As uh, most are hopefully aware by now, as the deadline is looming, the province is now entirely responsible for the homeowner grant program and the city can no longer accept applications. Uh, home, all homeowners must apply directly to the province online or over the phone. I have a website uh, address in the link there, which is uh, gov.bc.ca homeowner grant or uh, call uh, 888-355-2700 to speak with a representative from the province. We've been uh, assisting lots of people at the front counter uh, to get in touch uh, and uh, find, figure out the process for this uh, new change. Uh, that's all I wanted to touch on at the moment. Happy to answer questions. Great, <clears throat> thank you. Any questions? I don't see any questions for you tonight. Um, I just have one question about the OCP. Does the place speak, how long will it be up again? Uh, that's a good question. I'm not sure if uh, Ms. Chino is still up. Good. There she is. Excellent. Thanks for asking that. We, we've decided to keep the surveys for both projects up for another two weeks. So, Great. Um, so yeah, we'll provide an update on that. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you. Thanks, Michelle. Thank you. And thank you for the reminder as well for the homeowner grants. Just wrote that back on my to-do list. It seemed to have fallen off. So, <laughs> okay. So that council received the June 21st, 2021 report of the chief administrative officer for information. Gary moved, seconder. Councillor Bruce, or Councillor Duncan. All those in favor? Any opposed? Motion carried. And next on the list is the Vancouver Island Health Authority Sharps collection flow through funding. Is there someone from staff? Is it either Ms. Crossman or Mr. Diverta that's going to speak to this? I can take, take that one again. Mayor okay. State. So as council's aware, uh, we got a grant uh, last year to expand the, the, the Sharps program that's operated by uh, CMHA that had been operating with funding on and off from uh, Island Sorry, health. just one one second. I'm just going to interrupt. I just we just uh, Councillor Middlemiss. I feel like I should probably leave this conversation. Yeah. Thanks. I'll just. Okay. Sorry. Okay. That's okay. Should Miss Shudik, can you remove Councillor Councillor Middlemiss into the waiting room for a moment? Remove her there. I got it. She's gone. Okay. Excellent. Okay. Sorry. Carry on. It's pure. Okay. Um, the, yeah, so, so Island Health has been funding that on and off uh, for the, since, since the uh, uh, overdose prevention site uh, first went in a number of years ago. And, uh, but the, it had um, funding had decreased down to a point where it wasn't uh, addressing the full need. Uh, the city was successful with some partner organizations in applying for a grant to expand the program back to seven days a week, three hours a day for two individuals, and also supply so also supplies a vehicle so that they can uh, have a more a broader uh, area of coverage. Uh, for the months of February, March, and uh, April of this year, there was 2,500 sharps uh, collected and uh, newly expanded to the program because they now have a, a, a truck that we've uh, uh, supplied as part of this expanded program. They've also collected uh, 3,000. Uh, kilograms of debris over that three month period as well. So uh, uh, quite successful. Uh, however, Island Health has uh, given a recent notice that as that the uh, that why they want to continue the program, their their own uh, operations and, and regulations or, or processes would require that they go into tender. However, they they said that they would be able to extend the service at least as far as uh, March uh, 2022 if the city uh, since we already had a contract now with CMHA would uh, add their funding to it so we, the city would end up being a flow through uh, so no change to the program itself just that the city becomes uh, uh, the the main director if you will of the of the uh, contract um, so we have a, we would have a contract with Island Health and in turn one with uh, CMHA and CMHA would then only have one uh, contract with uh, either one of us. Um, there might be some apprehensions about what that would lead to for the future. 
uh, so over the next uh, number of months, we'll have some conversations with CHA and, and Island Health as to what the future holds as the city's funding is only only a one shot. The, the program is not uh, continuing funding. So we'll have to see how the whole program can be funded going forward. Thank you. And is there is there a number that people call that when they need services? Is that, is that how this program? Can you just refresh our minds about that? Yeah. So it's it's both. So they do proactive um, patrols um, of the various quadrants. So there's there's uh, the the area. I um, was remiss in not touching on that. So the area is sort of four quadrants with uh, Trunk Road and uh, Trans Canada Highway bisecting the four quadrants. And the quadrants run from uh, Boys Road um, to Beverly Street and uh, from, from East Road to um, Government Street. So um, so it, it, it's, it's in the core area. Now the, the agreement struck that uh, if after doing that area, they have the time and the resources permit, they will branch out into larger areas uh, outside the, the immediate core area, even as far as um, Chimane or, or further abroad, if 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 they get a call for service fares. Um, but it, the primary area is the core the core area. As well, they'll do if they have time other areas parks that might be just outside those uh, immediate uh, four quadrants. So so they're doing what they can to um, to uh, have as much impact as they can with the program. Great, thank you. Are there other questions from council um, right now? Number wise, I just missed the number. Oh, okay, I don't see any other questions. Oh, Councillor Newington, go ahead. Yes, thank you very much, <clears throat> Mayor Staples. My only question is, is there any liability at, at all um, attached with this for the city? Uh, no, both both the contract with the uh, Island Health um, and then particularly the flow through to um, CMHA uh, make sure that there's, they provide our uh, liability insurance and, and coverage. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, seeing none, I'll read the motion that council approve the flow through funding of $17,208 from VHA to CMHA to continue the current Sharps collection program to March, 2022. And the council directs staff to prepare a budget amendment to include the $17,208 funding in matching expenditures in the 2021 operating budget. Do I have a mover and a seconder for that? Any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? Any opposed? Motion carries. Just Mayor okay. Staples, to your, uh, to, yeah. to your question about the phone number, it, it is listed in my CA report, but I'll just mention it now just for, for reference. It's 250-732-7736. Okay. That would be, it would be great if we could do maybe a, a social media post or something about it with that number again through the city just to let people know that it's being continued and it's happening and how to connect with it. And thanks for all your work on that. Uh, did I, I don't, okay, we're good. Okay. So Councilor Minimus is back. We'll go to reports of staff. Community Cobb Oven, request for expression of interest. So who is taking this on? I see Councillor Duncan's hand. Looks like we've lost Peter. <laughs> Councillor Duncan, go ahead. Okay, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. I have to move the alternate option uh, that Council referred the Community Cobb Oven request for expression of interest results report to the next committee of the whole meeting for further discussion. And if I get a seconder, I'll explain why. Councilor Caps, second, go ahead. Okay, so my biggest concern with all these numbers is like the, the oven's been around for eight years. I need to know how much it's been used uh, over that period of time because, you know, reading the, the, we're trying to get this as a freestanding operation in the future. But I need to know what, what it's been doing for the last eight years before I can make any decision on, on these figures, you know, 
16,000 and 5,000 and ongoing. So I really need uh, staff to bring back the information on how many times it was used, what sort of income that was generated. There must be some sort of report uh, because it was community kitchens that was doing it before. So that's the reason why I've, I've uh, moved alternate option one. Thank you. Okay. Um, we have lost Mr. Divertai. So I'm just going to get us to wait a moment. Mayor Staples, I might add that uh, the CAO is trying to get back on because his computer was a bit glitchy. So he signed off and is coming back on. Okay, so we're just gonna hold it for just a moment. Mm -hmm. While we're waiting, is there anything else any other council member wants to say right now about this motion that's on the floor that isn't a question that staff needs to answer? Um, Councillor Brooke, go ahead. No, thank you, Mayor. Um, yeah, I, I uh, certainly uh, would second that uh, proposal by Councillor Duncan. The concern I have is with just one proposal, how do we have any knowledge whether that's a good proposal or a poor one? They've, they've laid out some costs, but but there's there's nothing attached to the, the costs to see if they're reasonable or not. I, I just am afraid we're going into this, uh, you know, virtually blind and and certainly support uh, Councillor Duncan's uh, uh, request that this get before a committee of the whole meeting for further study. Thank you. So, um, Mr. Diverti, while you were gone, Councillor Duncan moved... Um, the alternate motion and spoke to wanting to receive a report uh, from staff at a, at a committee of the whole meeting at our next committee of the whole meeting about the use over the past eight years of the Cobb oven itself. That's sort of where we got and then you disappeared. So we <laughs> were really waiting. That. Not sure what happened there. Just completely lost the internet for a brief moment and then it took me a while to get back. So uh my apologies so was there uh, any particular discussion other than the resolution to um it was the question about it can um that council councillor duncan asked that at the next committee the whole meeting that we get a report talking about how it has been used over the the, the number like the amount of use over the past eight years that was the request okay I, before we can, we can make a decision yeah we <clears> can <throat> certainly try to get that if, uh, obviously that's with the organization that's no longer operating it so we i know we have at least one year that we got a recap of the utilization but i don't know whether they'll what, what the records have otherwise but we can attempt to get that for you um, also, just uh, if, if you would like, um, uh, Judy Stafford to hear from uh, Couch and Green Community, if you had any particular questions about their proposal, um, we, um, as, as we mentioned in our, our report from the 15th or, or staff's report from the 15th, that, um, you know, the House of Friendship had been operating it for a number of years um, and um, had... Uh, for at, at, at essentially no cost to see some initial grants to get things uh, set up. Um, and then, but they were just finding that it was getting to be too much and affecting their otherwise operations. And so council prior to doing any renovations to the Cobb oven directed that we do uh, an expression of interest uh, to see if there were other organizations willing to step forward. And the only proposal that we did receive was um, Couch or Green Committee, which we're thankful to have someone step up um as uh it's not really in our normal sort of wheelhouse for for operating such a such a community um uh benefit so um yeah with that um uh, fine to uh, again i think it'd be useful if you have any particular questions for um uh, uh miss stafford but uh, she's not gonna be able to answer specifically i don't think unless she's um knows more than i do about what history there was for utilization. So I think that the question that Councillor Brooke proposed possibly um, Ms. Stafford could speak to. Councillor Brooke, did you want to just restate your question? 
Um, thank you, Mayor. Um, yeah, I, I'm, I have some concern that with just one proposal, we have no way to um, view it uh, against other proposals. Uh, we would normally have um, not necessarily competing offers, but other offers that look at the same thing. And, and so we can get a sense of this is a reasonable cost or, or this is excessive cost. Um, and we don't have anything at all to gauge this against. So I'm personally, I'm just flying blind. I have no idea whether that's reasonable or excessive or what. So, uh, you know, if, if, uh, if Ms. Stafford can, uh, could uh, bring some clarity to that, I would appreciate it. Ms. Stafford. We can't hear you. Your mute looks like it's off, but. Oh, can you hear me now? Now we can hear you, yeah. Okay, sorry. Go ahead. My headset wasn't plugged in properly. Um, okay, so back to the first question that Tom brought up. Um, it, it, it wasn't our oven, so I don't have that, but I did have a very long conversation with the person that used to manage the oven, and she felt that it was getting to a point where it was self-sustaining. And my intention in writing this proposal was not to then come back to the city and say, you know, we need more money, we need more money. I don't, I have no interest in, in, in taking on another project <laughs> that then I'm, it's gonna be grant dependent. So the whole intention of this project was to make it self-sustaining and, and it would generate money through rentals, um, birthday parties, especially. Um, we have some other ideas um, of how to get the usage up. And so um, I can't really speak to the exact number, but the person that did used to run it said that when it was, there was a dedicated person looking after it, then it, it was busy and was generating money enough to pay her wage, which is our intention. I think the trouble happened when it wasn't getting utilized and wasn't a focus of the organization that was running it. We're right down the street. We, you know, food, this is, as far as we're concerned, it is our wheelhouse food security. We, we've used the oven. Um, we want to use it for our summer camp kids, for example, for our cooking classes when our summer camp starts again in a couple of weeks. Um, and then to the other question, um, it, it is tricky to get the cost because Cobb is, a specialty. And so Pat Amos and Alka Cole, who are the two people that we're engaging on this project and this restoration are both, to be honest, the only Cobb people I personally know in this community, there may be others. Um, and the repair is really um, only as a result of it not being utilized. So, and as a result of it not having proper security, which is the idea of having these, you know, pull down gates so that it could be locked up. And then I would suggest that after that point, the vandalism would be minimal. And then the ongoing operation and maintenance would also be minimal. We have two other Cobb structures that Pat has built for us. And um, we have one bench right outside, outside our offices uh, at our building. And other than oiling it once every couple of years, it's, it's very low maintenance. Um, but then it's also, you know, it's looked after because we're there. So. That's all I can, that's all the additional information I can provide at this point. Um, when I wrote the proposal, I didn't, I wasn't asked or did I understand that I would get, have to give um, exact quotes or get more than one quote. Uh, otherwise I, you know, I could have done something like that. Um, I think also, obviously, you know, we've worked with the city before and if we can save, I think $16,000 is, is an estimate to be honest. Um, and if it takes less time or we find a different process to make the structure more secure, we would definitely go for that option and not spend the entire budget if we didn't have to. Okay, thank you. Councillor Bruce and then Councillor Capps. Councillor Bruce. There we go. Sorry about that. Thank you That's very okay. much. That's okay. Yeah. Uh, technology is my strong point. Um, <laughs> I, I hate to say it, but I'm, I'm not the least bit interested in the Cobb oven and, I, and probably to shouts of booze and all the rest of it. But 
I, I, I've been down there a few times in the last few days. I'm appalled by what I look at. I can't see a way that we could secure the thing properly and make it look good. I don't want something with a, uh, I, you're talking pull down uh, security uh, curtains around it. Um, and I know that uh, when I was there on Sunday, there were, there, there were people sleeping in the front of it there now, of course, it's, it's uh, gone to uh, kind of a bad state of affairs right now. I certainly would not uh, want the city to pay as much as a dime, as I've said before, I'm not interested in the city taxpayer paying anything for, if you can get grants or something, or the Rotary Club wants to look after it or the Kinsmen or something, great. But the city of Duncan, I don't think the taxpayer should be paying anything for the for this, uh, this Cobb oven. Thank you. Councillor Caps. Thank you, Mayor Staples, uh, and thank you, Ms. Stafford, for being here as well and, and for the uh, expression of interest on this. And I would have to respectfully disagree with a lot of the points that, that you made, Councillor Bruce. I think that this kind of interesting community amenity is something that I think we should be funding. Um, I do agree that it would be good to discuss the details of this at the Committee of the Whole. That's why I seconded that. I think it would be good to maybe take a bit of a closer look at if Council wants to discuss this further before making a decision. I definitely support that. Um, it would be nice if we'd gotten a lot of applications of, of interest, but neither Rotary nor the Kinsmen applied. And I think that the Cowichan Green community is a, a good fit, the nature of the organization to take something like this on as described the way that you described the intended use of it, Ms. Stafford. I think that would be a really good fit. Um, and I think that the type of investment that we're talking about is what and maybe, again, like you said, maybe not specifically that dollar amount, but some sort of initial investment to bring it back up to a standard where it is sufficient and, and self-sustaining. Um, things, when they're not used, do fall into disrepair, right? And it does take a little bit of work and a little bit of money to get them back to a place where that doesn't need to be an ongoing cost. Um, I've had a few people reach out to me with concern that the cob oven was going to be gotten rid of. Um, and I again, I think it's a really interesting community amenity and I think that we've learned a lot recently about the need for outdoor gathering spaces um, especially over this past year so in in general I'm supportive of this but I'm also supportive of the idea of discussing it further the committee the whole thank you thank you anyone else from council want to add anything right now councillor Duncan go ahead uh, thank you, uh, Madam Mayor. And I, Judy, yes, I really do want to thank you for the for submitting the report. I just really need to have those sort of cost numbers before I can make the decision. So thank you for submitting uh, the report. Thanks. Okay, and I see no other hands right now up. So um, the motion on the table is that this gets deferred to the next committee of the whole meeting for further discussion with the um actually Ms. Chittick, can you read the motion because there was a, the addition would be for the um the usage to be provided so we have uh, the council refer the community cob oven request for expression of interest results report to the next committee of the whole meeting for further discussion um, with the addition of a report on the use of Cobb. The use of the oven, not yeah. the use. Cobb yeah. oven, sorry, the Cobb yeah. oven. Yeah. Okay, excellent. Okay, um, and then I just want to add that when this did come into the newspaper, um, it was one of the few times on social media that I actually saw a lot of um, concern about it being removed. There was a a lot of positive feedback from people about their experiences there, about what they wanted to use it for. And it was, a, I saw a, a ton of positive um, comments and interest from the community and a lot of concern about it being removed. So I just wanted to add that into the discussion as well. I think as Councillor Cap stated that there's a lot of people wanting to you know, hold a lot of a lot more events in different ways than they're used to doing and that that is a really good gathering space for people to do that. And the park has certainly been utilized in ways it hasn't before. And I hope it actually continues to grow. So I will call the question. All those in favor? Any opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. And thank you, Ms. Stafford. 
Thank you. Can I just ask when that meeting is? When that meeting will be? It should be in July at our next meeting, before our next meeting, correct, Mr. Divertai? Oh, you're on mute. Sorry, we don't have one booked at the moment, but that's certainly an option. So we can pull council, make sure that they're available for, for that uh, to come in earlier for that particular meeting. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Good night. Thanks for allowing me to speak. Thanks. I appreciate it. Good night. Good night. Okay. So next on the agenda, we have the City of Duncan annual report. The council adopt the City of Duncan 2020 annual report as presented. We have a mover and a seconder. Is there any discussion on the report? I see no hands going up. Okay, I'll call the uh, question then. Oh, there, sorry, go just, ahead. Just, yep. just wanted to note, I wasn't sure if uh, Bernice was gonna speak to it or not, but uh, as uh, required, it's it's been up uh, for- see her. She was there a minute ago, but she, she <laughs> got kicked out maybe. <laughs> oh, there we go, now she's back. We must have stuck her in the waiting room or something. Okay. <laughs> Anyway, we were just going to note that it, it was uh, posted on the city's website and, and we had uh, advertised that it was available uh, a couple weeks ago uh, as required by the legislation. So. Excellent. Thank you. Is there uh, Councillor Brooke, go ahead. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I would just like to uh, uh, commend uh, um, Ms. Crossman and, and her helpers uh, for the thoroughness of this uh, and very readable uh, uh, annual report as well. Thank you. Yes, it looks amazing. Anyone else? All right, all those in favor. Motion carries. And I'm just gonna ask if we can just take a quick five minute break, stretch break. Is everyone okay with that? Yeah? Okay, so five minutes, it's 7.04 right now, so 7.09, we'll be back on. Thank you.
please. All right, thanks everyone. Looks like every, is everyone back? Almost, let's give Councilor Newington another moment. Oh, there she is. Okay. So next up is UBCM Convention Cabinet Minister Meetings. So this is for Council to direct staff on who, which ministers we would like to meet with this year at UBCM. I don't know if you want to speak to anything, Mr. Divertai. Last year, did we even have minister meetings last year? It's a bit of a blur, 2020, I have to confess. Uh, yes, we, we, I believe we had several. Um, Mayor Staples, uh, we <laughs> met with Minister Ebby, I believe, in September of 2020. Would have uh, been Rob Robinson, wouldn't it? Wouldn't that be pre-election? No, it was Minister Ebby for Attorney General. Right, 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 of course. And we met, met with Minister Darcy, uh, and we also met with Minister Robinson as well. So three, three different uh, ministers last time. And uh, as you know, and is in, listed in the report there, we, we had uh, noted in the November 2020 position paper of the city that uh, we, we would uh, attempt to meet with the uh, various ministers and we have as of yet not been able to set those up or, or had the time to move forward with those. So uh, those would actually be quite timely to uh, put those onto the list. And so that was uh, meeting with the, potentially to meet with the Minister of Education um, and around preventative measures uh, with respect to uh, uh, health and addictions and also to meet with the Attorney General to propose uh, larger penalties uh, for those that are arrested with large quantities of fentanyl, and also to meet with the Minister of uh, Health and Addictions with respect to, um, uh, well, there's a, a number of items listed there within the, uh, yep. the court. Okay, so direction from council. Where would you like to go this year? Who would you like us to talk to? Um, Councillor Duncan and then Councillor Newington. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I, you know, we still have a terrible addiction issue. So I think we should go back and speak to them again about the addiction issue and uh, just see what, you know, see where we can go. Uh, I, you know, let, let's stay the sort of squeaky wheel uh, is probably what I'm, I'm feeling that, you know, we can't let our... I, I'm not sure what the local numbers are for overdoses, uh, but I sure hear a lot of sirens around here every day. And uh, I think we still have to meet with the minister that's responsible for the addictions and see what we can do about that. It, it might also involve, again, we, we had mentioned about, uh, you know, larger or longer penalties for people that are that have fentanyl. We, we have to deal with that. Uh, we have to look at the sent, you know, ask, ask the attorney general to look at uh, sentencing on a consecutive basis, not on a concurrent basis. And then there actually is a deterrent. So a couple of things there, you know, Attorney General and the Addictions Minister, I think. Thank you. Councillor Newington. Oh, where'd you go? There you yeah, are. There. Sorry. Um, I totally agree with Councillor Duncan about that. My big concern is that our RCMP are doing their job and working so hard to deal with people, these people that are pushing large quantities of very dangerous drugs. And basically the courts are just slapping their hands and saying, don't do it again. And I don't think that that's fair to the citizens of Duncan nor to our RCMP who are doing their job. And I think if we, it's important that we meet with the Attorney General. And as Tom says that they need, to, the um, sentencing needs to change. Thank you. Any other council members? Councillor Councilor Middlemiss and then Councillor Brook. I think um, it might be, I mean, I know like policing is, I don't know, I just, the CAR 60 program um, is kind of non-existent right now, but I think is such an important aspect, um, you know, like 
the RCMP do a great job with what they have. They don't have a lot of mental health training. And I think, um, you know, having that CAR 60 program is just such an important piece. And, you know, we're seeing so many people um, and not every, not all homeless, but, you know, we do see it because of course the people that are homeless are more visible to us, but um, are struggling with mental health. Um, so I think if we, if possible, if we could push for, I don't know exactly all the ins and outs of why that program isn't really functioning right now or at a really minimum capacity, but if we, if we could push for maybe some funding for that, if that's a thing that might be a good, good start. Excellent. Thank you. And Councillor um, Newington, or is that right? No, sorry, Councillor Caps. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, I definitely, I, I agree with Councillor Middlemiss that it would be really good to lobby for some more support for that program. And forgive me um, if I'm wrong, but did I hear something about previously speaking to the education minister about a more, uh, or the, the minister that's responsible for that in, in regards to more of a preventative piece? Because I think that if we could talk about it from the angle of mental health and wellness supports um, from people that are in uh, elementary and secondary education, then that would ideally get us to a point in the community where there are fewer people that need to be responded to with police and emergency services. So if there's a way to tie that piece in, um, I would be, whether that would be of a, 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 a children or of education, I'm not certain who exactly we would want to request to speak to. Thank you. And, and I think that might be the Minister of Mental Health and Addictions, um, their, their HOPE, I can't remember what the to, uh, Pathways to Hope program, I believe, is really focused around education in the schools. Um, and that there's been a lot of programming around that. So I think it would be, that would be a discussion that would happen there and, and also with the Minister of Education. Um, I saw another hand up. Councillor Brooke, go ahead. Thank you, Mayor. Um, you know, when I look at this list uh, from the city's position paper, uh, housing on affordability, opioid use, mental health, et cetera, et cetera, you know, truthfully, you could scratch out Duncan and you could write in any city's name. This is, this is a problem that is, that is almost universal. I think the strength that Duncan has is the fact that we work so uh, intertwined with our neighboring communities, working with the tribes, working with North Cowichan, working with the CBRD, and, and whatever direction we go in, we should focus on that, that we are trying to uh, work in conjunction with our neighbors to solve this. If the, if the government would step in and help, that would be a benefit. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? I think that um, looking at the list from last year and rereading all of it, it seems like 10 years ago we had these conversations, but I realize we've actually been having them every year um, for I'm not sure how many years now. And in the past year, because of COVID, we've had them more often than, you know, we've had the same conversations over and over again, I think, with ministers. And so... Um, I think to add to this, all the ministers from last year, but obviously the new ministers that are in their place. Um, and in addition, the education minister has come up. And then the other one would be the health minister because the, well, it's mental health and addictions that some of the funding runs under, it actually still runs under um, the health minister. And so my, one of the things that sort of I learned through the process of the last couple of years of talking to the different, different levels of ministries is that they do hold sort of more of the direction and funding. And <clears throat> one of the things that, um, you know, through the, through COVID that Dr. Bonnie Henry mentioned quite frequently um, has mentioned quite frequently is the, you know, the, 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 that's a co-current crisis. We're already in a crisis and an opioid crisis. And, um, and she spoke very loudly and clearly about that and about our need to address that. And many people have spoken about the need to address it, you know, um, with the same sort of level of urgency that we've addressed 
the pandemic. So I feel like that would be a good one to add to the list as well. Anyone else? And we can also look to see if our community, if our neighbors are wanting to meet with them. I know that there was a lot of success and I don't know how they're doing that with Zoom. Um, when we did meet together and had representation from the leadership table from, um, from I have a leadership meeting this week, so I can, I can ask about that uh, when we did attend each other's meetings, because again, as Councillor Brooke put it, we're all, we are all working together in Couchin, so it's good to have us be united when we're speaking to the ministers about these, um, about addressing these issues as well. And one additional one that I'd like to add in here would be around, um, I think it would be the Minister of Municipal Affairs, Mr. Devertai, but uh, it is being talked about at numerous places. And I've seen a bit of information about it, but not enough around um, the idea of hybrid meetings continuing. And so I think um, so that if there are council members who are only able to attend by a Zoom or staff for all sorts of different reasons, that hybrid meetings become, um, you know, something that we carry on with post-COVID? I think, uh, Mayor Staples, I think that's definitely coming. They've de definitely given indication okay. that that is coming. So um, okay. given we already have six, I think, if I'm counting correctly, on, on <laughs> and, we, and we have to okay. write briefing notes for those by the end of this month to get them in. Uh, okay. I think uh, th three would have been my, my, my goal, but uh, six is going to keep us uh, pretty slammed for the next next bit to get to do those well okay a lot of them cross over so some will certainly cross over for yeah. sure. okay so i'm glad to hear that that is in the works because i think that's going to be really important for us continuing to um, be able to increase diversity in membership at all of the tables that we sit at so thank you so do we need a motion for that or i think that would be useful we, do we have direction if I'm hearing correctly, we've got the Attorney General, the Minister of Education, the Minister of Health and Addiction, the um, Minister of Health, and also the Housing Minister. Mm -hmm. And it may be possible to meet with the Minister of Health and the Minister of Mental Health to, as one? Yes, that's uh, that. I believe how we had laid it out in the uh, position paper, but I, yeah. that depends on their schedules as well. So, okay. okay. All right. Uh, Excuse me, did you say Minister of Education? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, perfect. Thank you. All right. So a mover and a seconder for that. All those in favor? Motion carries. Thank you. Okay, and we will move on to uh, 7.4, janitorial services that council award the janitorial and gatekeeping contract to Sky Blue Services Corporation for a contract price of $5,270 a month plus tax as outlined in the June 21st report of the Director of Finance and the Council directs staff to negotiate, write and endorse a contract with Sky Blue Services Corp for a five-year contract term. Councillor Duncan, are you moving the motion? You're on mute, Councillor Duncan. You're on mute. Thank you. Uh, I, I move the, f the first part of the motion right now, but I would like to amend the second part of the motion. How, how should I do that? Propose the amendment now. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, I propose that uh, the contract period be for one year. Uh, be, and the reason being is that um, I need, so, again, I need some more background information on uh, shouldn't, should this be a full-time position uh, on the city? I know it's a, it looks like part-time work, but it's a lot of money to um, authorize. I don't want to authorize 60, 000, almost $60,000 a year for the next five years without some more information on exactly what the, the services that are being provided and if we cannot do this in-house in on our own. So I don't know how to, to change that other than just the, the term to one year and, and with a review to explain why this isn't an in-house job. So maybe can we ask the question of staff about the in-house job? And that would be, I believe, Mr. Devertai, I think, or Ms. Kosman. I'm not sure which one. Ms. Kosman, go ahead. Um, we can certainly, thank you, Mayor, through to council. We can certainly do a cost-benefit analysis of having um, a staff person 
do this work. Um, it, it would require possibly some negotiation with the union because this is evening work and after hours work. And it's also kind of awkwardly spread out. There's gate opening in the morning and gate closing at night. And there's some early morning cleanings of the washrooms versus some later evening cleanings of the washrooms. And when 39 days of July is on, then it goes to, I think the washrooms close at nine or 10. So it's a bit, um, it could be awkward to have a staff person doing that sort of spread out piecemeal work, but it's worth um, a review and take a look at it. And I'm happy to do it um, for the, after the one year renewal. Thank you. Okay. Councillor Newington. Thank you, Mayor. Um, my question is that um, this uh, company seems to be based out of Edmonton. It, was there not any uh, locally owned companies that would be able to do this job? You know, I just really want to support our local people here. And um, it makes, to me, it makes more sense to keep the dollars giving jobs to people here. Ms. Crossman, is that you again? Yeah, Mayor Staples through to Councillor Newington. This company is from Edmonton. They have um, employees all over BC and Alberta. Um, they do quite a few municipal halls. Um, I spoke to a bunch of their references. Um, for instance, City of Williams Lake, they have some shoppers drug marts. Um, they do, they just look, they hire local people to do the work. So they wouldn't be bringing in employees from elsewhere. It would be people that live here. Um, the bids that were received were all over, some were in Victoria, a few were in Vancouver. I suspect they would do the same sort of thing as, as hire local people. Um, but the Brothers Janitorial is who does our current contract and they are local. Um, but as you can see, their price went from 4600 a month to 9600 a month. Mm -hmm. And so um, that's why we recommended to go with the sky blue with uh, 5270 per month. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Councillor Brooke? Thank you, Mayor. Um, while I don't have any objection to using sky blue, uh, I, I just wonder, um, you know, there's such a huge disparity of, of, of proposals here to, to the biggest one of 34,000, but Brothers Janitorial, who currently has the contract, for some reason, they thought it required them to double the cost of service that they're providing. So my concern is Sky Blue is perhaps not seeing it as clearly as they would have. So um, having them having them have a one-year contract is uh, and reviewable after that is, is probably a good thing. Thank you. Councillor Duncan. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. <clears throat> perhaps the existing uh, supplier has had to do a lot more over the COVID period, and that might be why they've increased their bid so much uh, from what it was. So that's the only thing I can think of, uh, you know. But uh, you know, I think that we do that. Uh, the offer to have it reviewed uh, is the best way for us to go at this time. You know, award the one year and let's let's have a review after that one year. Okay. Anyone else, Councillor Bruce? I'm just wondering if uh, if Sky if Sky Blue would entertain a one year contract uh, if they're asking for a five year I guess what uh, they're looking at it, if they have to set up um, is a one year even worth them doing it uh, I guess we'll find that out if we were to uh, express our interest in a one year contract I suppose. Okay. Any other questions? Okay, seeing no hands. So the motion on the floor stands the first part of the motion and then rather than five year, the second part has been um, changed upon making the motion to a one year contract term. So 
a mover and a, was Tom move, or Councillor Duncan move that? Uh, do you have a seconder? Yeah. With the staff uh, providing the business case, they were. Uh, yeah. And do you have a seconder for that? Councillor Brook, any more discussion on the motion on the floor? Seeing no hands, all those in favor, motion carries. Thanks. All right, thank you. And we'll move on to the statement of financial information that council approved the 2020 statement of financial information as attached to the June 21st, 2021 report by the director of finance. Do I have a mover and a seconder for this? And is there anything you'd like to say about this, Ms. Crossman? Thank you, Mayor Staples. This is the report that is sent to the province every year that shows um, the statement of financial information for the previous year. And there's not anything really new in here. It's very similar to previous years and it is due to the province by June the 30th. All right, any questions from council? Seeing no hands, all those in favor? Motion carries. And we will go to 2021 budget updates. The council received the report titled 2021 budget update dated June 21st, 2021 by the director of finance for information only. Do I have a mover and a seconder? Ms. Crossman. Thank you, Mayor Staples. So this um, budget update you may notice is in a slightly different format than you're used to. So I'm testing out this new format. So it's significantly easier for me to prepare. However, it provides less detailed information to council. Now I wouldn't entertain using this format for the budgeting process, but I was seeing how council thought about it for the in between updates that I do every four months or so. Um, if there is not enough detail on this report, I'm happy to move back to the way we used to do it, which involves exporting the data out of our software program and putting it into a spreadsheet and then massaging it into what you see with, with some parts broken out and some parts summarized. Um, so there, there's this, this one is maybe five pages, I think. No, maybe a few more than that. And I think the other one could have been around 20 pages. So it, it definitely has a bit less information and less detail. Um, so I'm interested in hearing council's opinion if you prefer the previous reports that you're used to that are more similar to what you see during the budget season. And otherwise, I'm happy to take any questions on any of these um, financial details for January to May. Okay, is there any feedback from Council about the question? Councillor Duncan, go ahead. Thank you, uh, thank you, Miss um, Crossman. So do you, you would have to do the same amount of background work and research whether you were doing the old process or the new process, because I, you know, I, I'm used to this sort of year to date stuff, because when you look at pensions and stuff, you get quarterly reports, right? So I don't have a problem with getting a midterm report like this. And, then, and, and, you know, it's succinct and, and it's definitely workable. So if you have to do the same sort same amount of work and it's not, and in fact, if it's a little less then that's even better. So, you know, I, I, the, the format is fine for me. Anyone else? I just see, see thumbs up. So looks like it's good. Okay. So um, uh, could I get a mover and a seconder on the motion, please? And any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? Motion carries. And we will move on. Thank you, Ms. Kossman. We'll move on to 7.7 .7 McAdam and Rotary Parks Master Plan Adoption. That council adopt the McAdam and Rotary Parks Master Plan is attached to the 20, June 21st, 2021 staff report from the manager of planning. Do I have a mover and a seconder for this? All right, Ms. Cheneau. It's been a long process. <laughs>
Thank you, Mayor Staples. Um, can everyone see my presentation screen? Okay, just confirming I have the right screen on. Um, <clears throat> oops. So the McAdam and Rotary Parks Master Plan is the long-term strategy for managing and improving Duncan's uh, major assets, these two uh, parks uh, in the southeast corner of the city. <clears throat> and uh, the last presentation to council was the draft plan in August 2020. Um, and earlier phases of the plan included phase one gathering ideas, which began in 2018. Um, and phase two, uh, which ran from 2018 to spring 2019 and then the development of the plan. So uh, in phase three, we went uh, back to the public again, and uh, we, we posted the draft plan on our website and posted uh, public surveys that were available to complete online or uh, by picking up uh, hard copies in person. And we also were able to hold two in-person events in September in one in each of the parks. Um, at which we um, actually had uh, quite good attendance. We were able to speak with around 85 or so people. And um, in addition to uh, filling out the surveys, we also took a lot of notes and comments um, on the draft plan. And we also, um, with our notifications, we were also able to increase uh, the viewership on the project website on PlaySpeak as well. <clears throat> uh, so I've included the graphic summary of uh, phase three engagement and we've also attached the entire engagement strategy, uh, summary to the report as well. Uh, so some of the key themes were that participants strongly supported uh, environmental protection and restoration uh, of ecologically sensitive areas within the park. Uh, and of course, uh, safety for all park users um, was a major theme as well. Uh, there was general support for restoration, as I mentioned, of natural areas. Um, upgrading trails and facilities, including uh, the proposed new playground area in McAdam Park, <clears throat> and increasing park maintenance um, and park patrols as well. Uh, there was some, some mixed feedback, uh, which I think has been seen throughout the plan development on the allocation of space for off-leash dogs. Um, but many were supportive of the, of the areas that were shown in the plan. And there's um, expressed concerns about the presence of illegal activities, um, presence of invasive species in natural areas, uh, the parking areas and uh, potential um, and past experienced conflicts between off-leash dogs and other park users. And then um, some discussion as well on the cost of the upgrades that were being proposed. So I've included a list and some further detail than this uh, within my report, as well as a, a full table summarizing each of the changes we've made to uh, the draft plan. So this included um, incorporating uh, some very detailed feedback from Couch and Tribe staff. So this included some wording changes, also uh, removing reference to public access to the dike and areas west of the highway and, and Silver Ridge. Um, and then we've also added some language to consider signage to specify river points um, with dog access and signage to limit access to some river access points. Um, as well as the, uh, some new, the new action to review and update overnight sheltering and parks policies as improvements are implemented and conditions are monitored in the park. Um, we've also um, acknowledged some of the challenges and concerns that 
bylaw services and the public are facing within the parks. And we've made some revisions to the timeframes for the recommended actions and the implementation tables within the plan. And I've included in my presentation uh, several of the maps from the plan. I'm just going to go over some of them briefly. Um, so it starts out with uh, identifying the existing park features um, and those are explained in detail within the plan, um, including some of the current concerns with each of those areas. And the plan is divided into uh, three main zones. Uh, so there's the upland zone, which is mainly McAdam Park. And there's the lowland zone within Rotary Park. And then there's a large riparian and natural areas zone that uh, includes areas of both parks and includes the Fish Gut Alley riparian area and areas adjacent to the river. <clears throat> the master plan concept is broken up into uh, five different sections. So these are the upland zone and lowland zone and riparian and natural area zone that I mentioned previously, as well as uh, circulation improvements and uh, safety programs. <clears throat> and so just as an example, of one of the recommendation areas and included this. This is actually um, an example. <laughs> There's uh, some changes to the timeframes within this one. I've included an example from the, the past draft plan. So this is just to show that each recommendation section uh, breaks down uh, why this is recommended, um, each of the actions, as well as the time frame they're recommended for and cost range and other organizations that may be involved. <clears throat> and there's the lowland area example um, just zoomed in from the from the master concept and riparian areas. <clears throat> so I'm sure council is aware where we've um, throughout this plan process, we've continued to work with uh, fisheries biologists and other experts and, and local organizations on planning for improvements uh, to riparian areas and fish habitats. Uh, we've also been very fortunate that the Couching Green community and other organizations got involved last year and um, have started some pollinator planting areas and um, invasive plant removal programs as well as a lot of um, programming related to those activities. And then we also have uh, specific maps uh, showing uh, more detail on the circulation uh, recommendations. So these are including improvements to the park trail network and um, signage throughout the park as well. <clears throat> so uh, I'll just show you the, the existing park area, the, the area in, that has a kind of yellow tone to it, shows the existing off-leash dog areas within the park. Um, so not a huge change to these off-leash areas, but uh, the plan identifies um, changing some of the trails uh, to specifically on-leash paths and then off-leash paths um, in the southern portion of the park. <clears throat> it also identifies some potential barrier locations, uh, fences or other types of barriers uh, where natural areas may need some further protection from dogs and other users. And there's recommendations for informational and wayfinding signage as well as interpretive and educational signage within the parks, as well as regulatory signs such as for off-leash dog users. Um, there's uh, recommendations for lighting within specific areas within the park. And then the management recommendations, um, not all of them are shown on the map um, as they apply to the entire park areas. 
<clears throat> so next steps are if council uh, approves the plan adoption tonight, we will um, we will update stakeholders and the public, and we will um, continue to move forward with coordinating uh, among staff and consultants and external organizations on park improvements and incorporate the recommendations from the plan into other current projects, such as the OCP review and the transportation and mobility strategy development. Excellent, thank you. <clears throat> are there any questions from, oops, are there any questions from council at this time? Councilor Newington. Uh, actually, it's not, it's not so much a question as a comment. Um, I very much appreciate this. I'm one of the stakeholders. I'm down there all the time, as I think most of council is. Um, I was very pleased to see that they, um, the thought of people that have mobility issues was taken into consideration. And while I do like my dog to be able to do what he wants to do in one area in the city, um, I think it's good that we're going to have a few little areas that are going to be on leash to, for people to feel more comfortable. You've done a fantastic job of pulling all this together and I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else from council? No? Okay. And yeah, just to echo the incredible amount of work that has gone into this and diligence and, um, and process and, and the number of, of community members that you've reached and connected with through this. Just thank you so much to, to you and all of your team who's worked on this. It's much appreciated. Okay, so I'll call the question. All those in favor? Motion carries. Thank you. Sorry, Ms. Chanel, were you gonna say something? No, I just said thank you. Oh, thank you. Okay. Next, we have 7.8 development permit with variances for Jubilee Street, 545 Jubilee Street. Um, Ms. Cheneau, that will be you. And it looks like we have a couple of people joining us. Now, I, I don't have your names up on the screen. So if you can just take a moment to to introduce your full names to introduce yourselves that would be fantastic thank you mayor it's uh, kyle plant here i believe uh, dale plant and um jack james is also um logging on okay I, so jack james it looks like you are the one that says james on your screen and dale must still be logging on I see someone trying to connect here. So we'll just give it another moment. Thank you. Welcome. Um, and I'm Eduardo Sousa here. And, and, and Eduardo, yeah. Yeah, you can hear me. I've been going back and forth between YouTube and Zoom. So I'm a little uncoordinated. <laughs> <laughs> so you, you can hear me okay now. So yeah. We can hear you okay, absolutely. And if everybody can just keep their um, mute on, please. That would be fantastic. And I'm a member of the advisory design panel for you folks. Excellent. And it's a pleasure to be here. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. So Ms. Cheneau, did you want to wait until our final guest has, I'm not sure what's going on. That looks like they're having some trouble connecting. Oh, there we go. Okay. I'll just get started. Absolutely. Um, with going over, uh, some information on the proposed development. Um, <clears throat> and then we will give, um, as mentioned in my report, uh, we will give the representative from the advisory design panel an opportunity to comment as well on the response to the ADP's recommendations um, and the applicants available if there are any questions. <clears throat> So this uh, development permit with variances for 545 Julie Street is for a proposed six unit, three story development. Uh, this came to council last month. Um, 
just for confirmation on the procedure with advisory design panel, because this was a development permit that was approved back in 2016 um, and then uh, lapsed and uh, the new owners are applying with a very similar design and the same architect. Um, but we did send it back to the advisory design panel for review at the end of May. <clears throat> the location is just north of the downtown core on the northwest corner of First and Jubilee Street. Uh, the applicants also own the property adjacent to this one uh, to the west, 231 First Street, and have um, plans in the future. Uh, for another multi-unit uh, residential development there. <clears throat> so um, as summarized in the report, the, the advisory design panel reviewed this in May, 2021 and had the following recommendations to um, orient the southernmost unit entrance from Jubilee Street to First Street, which has been incorporated in the drawings, uh, to create more definition and private space for units along Jubilee Street, uh, which has been incorporated as well with uh, fences and, and decks with sitting areas, uh, to break up the south elevation uh, aluminum sided wall with a living wall or alternative finishing materials. Um, the applicants have chosen to uh, to insert uh, some windows in that area within the design. So I'll show that later. Um, to apply a permeable surface for all of the rear driveway aisle. This has been partially accommodated in the design, um, but uh, with the costs and other considerations, uh, they've proposed uh, a com combination of permeable pavers and concrete paving for the rear drive aisle. And to extend the roof areas over the patios or, or on the west side. So that's actually referring to the second story balconies on the west side. Um, and this has been incorporated in the revised drawings. There are a number of uh, requested variances that are included in the recommendation um, and that uh, public notification was circulated on. Um, so those include uh, to the front setback from three meters to 1.7 meters. Um, and I'll just note that the ground level setback is two meters, but there is a portion uh, that is cantilevered, uh, which requires the setback to be 1.7 meters. Um, this is, somewhat similar to the habitat development that was recently completed. Um, their setback is 1.8 meters. Um, and they're also, since the previous approval for this development, uh, there has been a, a road dedication of one meter along the Jubilee frontage incorporated in the design. <coughs> There's a setback uh, variance requested for the north side from 1.5 meters to one meter and a percent and the percentage of small car parking spaces from 50% to 100%. The number of total parking spaces for the development uh, from seven to six, which is one per unit. Uh, for visitor spaces from one, oops, one to zero and the two-way drive aisle width from 6.5 to 6.45, as well as the driveway access width for where the driveway meets the lane um, is proposed uh, for 3.8 meters and the works and services bylaw requires six meters for a two-way drive aisle, drive access. Oops. <clears throat> Not sure why that's showing so far out, but this is the revised site plan. So as I mentioned, um, it incorporates uh, seating area patios uh, on the Jubilee Street frontage for each unit. The entrance uh, on the southernmost unit on the left has been uh, reoriented from Jubilee Street to First Street. Uh, the previous uh, Asphalt paved drive aisle has been uh, changed to a combination of uh, concrete paving and paving stones. <clears throat> and um, 
a few other landscaping changes that were made from uh, what council saw in May as well. This is the front elevation for the proposed development on Jubilee Street and on the side elevations on the left hand side, which is the south elevation or sorry on the right hand side, which is the south elevation, you can see that there are windows added which are similar to the design for the north side. <clears throat> This is the rear of the development. So on the second story here, you can see the balconies, uh, which have had uh, increased uh, roof coverage so that the entire uh, balcony is covered uh, from the weather. And we have the updated uh, landscape plans as well, showing the changes. <clears throat> So we've included the recommendation here. And um, as Ms. Shittick mentioned at the beginning of the meeting, we have since the publishing of the agenda received two letters from the public. Um, one was asking whether the lane adjacent to the development would be paved and improved similar to the other side, the east side of Jubilee Street when it was built. Um, and that will be conducted as part of this development and part of the reason for the proposed um, right of way along the lane. <clears throat> and the second letter was um, stating uh, concerns due to the busyness of the intersections, uh, the design of the building, um, and potential shading to 245 First Street. Um, and wanting the, preferring the design to keep more uh, with surrounding buildings. So that's it for my presentation. Um, as I mentioned, we have uh, Eduardo Souza here to speak on the advisory design panels uh, recommendation and how that's been addressed. Excellent, thank you. Uh, uh, oh, Mr. He's still here? Yeah, he's still here. Would you like to speak to that right now, Mr. Souza? Yeah. Sure, thank you, Mayor Staples. Um, yeah, I think um, uh, generally, we, I think if I speak on behalf of the, the panel, we haven't actually talked since the proponent um, addressed all the various recommendations that we've made. I, I would say though, that since pretty well the majority of them have been met, that I think everyone was fairly satisfied um with with the uh, the improvements that we'd asked for the one thing is unfortunately around the, the percentage of permeable paving versus concrete it'd be nice to see a higher percentage of permeable paving because that was sort of our interest uh, in that but um can understand at the same time that that's not possible due to cost considerations would be nice to see more more of a mix around that um and the other thing is that we we talked about and um <clears throat> that ultimately it's going to be related to this proposal and that is the, the development of the next block as well and what we talked about is our hope that as it's developed that there are considerations around um, that there's going to be similar design treatments to this building as well so there's more of a coherent hole between the two buildings given their scale uh, as well and also there's a massive old uh, cedar tree on the corner there and that, that can be retained in some sort of way it's it's quite a a big old tree there on that second lot. But in terms of this particular, um, and so the two are kind of connected, but in terms of this particular proposal, I think uh, we're fairly satisfied with the uh, proponent's um, improvements to this. Excellent, thank you. Mr. Chanot, is there anything else you'd like to add at this time? Uh, no, there's, yeah, the, the tree that Eduardo mentioned is, um, is on the, uh, far west corner of, of the adjacent lot. So, so as you mentioned, that will be considered during the future design for that property. Thank you. Are there any questions at this time from council? Councilor Bruce, go ahead. Thank you, Mayor Staples. Um, uh, I agree with Eduardo that most, most things have been, uh, uh, dis uh, have been uh, brought to pass from the ADP meeting. Uh, one of the things, or a couple of things here that I'm just wondering what everyone thinks about um, 
the percentage of small car parking has gone from 50% to 100%. And I brought that up at the ADP meeting, but um, um, I'm, I am concerned that um, people that live there will have bigger vehicles. And we've gone to a situation where there's one parking spot per unit and no uh, visitor parking. And uh, does that mean then that if a fella has a pickup truck and is working somewhere in town that he cannot park his unit on, on that particular spot? Because, and I, I've been looking at the other development that was just finished, the Habitat house, the Habitat apartment block. And, and there are already uh, pickups parked on that as people are moving into it and getting it ready. And I think they're moving in, or it sure looks like it, that uh, they are small parking spots, but they are uh, big vehicles. And lots of people have big older vehicles. It's not stylish anymore, but but that's perhaps what can be afforded at this time or whatever. And my concern is that that doesn't spill out onto the street. Uh, the other concern I have, uh, Ms. Cheneau, is the, the alleyway again, the old alleyway. And uh, if, you could, if you could just speak to that as well, the alley, uh, we have, we have uh, we're, we're taking over a little wider alleyway space for paving, is that correct? That's correct. Uh, similar to to a block north um, for the habitat development, there's a one meter uh, statutory right of way provided on the lane. So widening the lane from uh, four and a half meters, I believe it currently is, to five and a half meters um, up to the entrance uh, to the driveway. Um, and <clears throat> Does that go down the whole lane, Michelle? Just for the length of this property. Just for, just for this few feet. Oh, okay, so what happens after that? So it, that would depend on, on future uh, development along the lane. Okay. And, we're all, and one of the things that we're looking at, I should also mention in the transportation and mobility strategy is is our current policies uh, in our zoning bylaw. We do recommend, we do require that development be accessed from the lane if it does have a lane at the rear of the property. Um, and so that's one of the things we'll be analyzing in the transportation and mobility strategy, whether to, uh, to continue that practice or to update our regulations to, um, to try to reduce some of the traffic on the lanes. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. What, Thank you. And just, just further that, the parking, do you, do, you, do you see that working okay then? A little small car parking all with no, with no exception? Does that work? I can, I can see that there in the past have been concerns with on-street parking, um, you know, with the proposed development and with um, some of our um, policies within our within our official community plan um, are to encourage uh, the use of uh, smaller vehicle, uh, more efficient vehicles or electric vehicles. Uh, there will be the ability to charge electric vehicles within each of these garages. Um, and we have policies within the OCP on approving variances for, for uh, reduced parking um, if it is an uh, considered a development that meets other objectives uh, within the OCP. Um, so this is a level th uh, going to be a level three uh, energy step code building. It's, um, you know, it's, it's very close to downtown, also a block away from the parking lot that we're currently um, working on expanding on Canada Avenue. So um, hopefully there will be um, a trend for further reductions in vehicle use i know it's it's a, a challenge to balance those to balance those things currently but i yeah. think that there is parking in the area to accommodate additional parking 
as it currently stands. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Any other questions from council? Okay, is there anything else right now, Ms. Chanel, that, no? Okay. Then I will go on to moving, um, reading out the motion. So everyone, dig in. The council approved the development permit with variances for 545 Jubilee Street as attached to the staff report from the manager of planning to permit the development of a three-story, six-unit residential building and to vary city bylaws as follows. One, zoning bylaw number 3166 to vary the section 4111, the minimum front parcel line setback from three meters to 1.7 meters. B, to vary section 4111, the interior side parcel line setback from 1.5 to one meter. C, to vary section 3.32.4, the maximum percentage of small car parking spaces from 50% to 100%. D, very section 3.31.1, the minimum number of required parking spaces from seven to six. E, very section 3.30.1, the minimum number of visitor parking spaces from one to zero. F, very section 3.32.1, the minimum two way aisle width from 6.5 meters to 6.45 meters. Two, works and services bylaw number 3158, very a, very schedule A, section 5.11, common driveway minimum width from six meters to 3.8 meters. And that DP 2021-02 be subject to the following conditions to be met prior to the issuance of a building permit. One, provision of a one meter road dedication for the Jubilee East frontage. Two, provision of a one meter statutory right of way for the lane north frontage. Three, provision of works and services fees and security deposits in accordance with the estimate prepared by the Public Works and Engineering Department. Four, provision of a stormwater management plan to the satisfaction of the manager of engineering. Five, provision of a security deposit for 125% of the proposed hard and soft landscaping costs. And that DP 2021-02 be subject to the following conditions to be met prior to the issuance of an occupancy permit for the development. One, completion of works and services as outlined in the estimate prepared by the Public Works and Engineering Department. Two, confirmation of the building archiving, or sorry, achieving BC building code energy step code level three and three registration of a covenant to provide shared vehicle access for the future redevelopment of 231 First Street. Do I have a mover and a seconder? I see a hand. Do I see another? Yes. Okay. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? Any opposed? None opposed, motion carries. Thank you very much everyone who came out tonight to um, present and to ask questions and for all the work that you've done over the years to bring this to the stage, much appreciated and noted. And we look forward to seeing what this looks like, having more, more homes for people. I'd like to thank the mayor, council, uh, ADP, Oh, we just lost you. Let's give Mr. Plant another moment. There he is. Okay. Sorry, you just um, disconnected for a moment there. If you want to just go ahead. You just have to take your mute off. There you go. Uh, thank you, Mayor, Council. ADP, city staff, um, really looking forward to, to building this uh, project and, uh, you know, feel free to, we're an open house, feel free to stop by any time and uh, we're, uh, we're really looking forward to it, so. Excellent, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. And I'd like to thank uh, um, Eduardo Sosa for joining us from the, the ADP. That's been a great help tonight, having that extra, um, someone represented from that committee. So thank you. Thanks everyone. And we will move on to 7.9, summary of permit, building permits. The council received the summary of building permits. May 2021 is attached to the June 21st, 2021 report of the building inspector for information only. Do 
Do I have a mover and a seconder? Is there any questions or discussion? Um, Councilor Duncan, go ahead. Thank you. Yeah, uh, the report looks great. We're, you know, it looks like we're starting to get back into building. Uh, the numbers are up, definitely up from last year. So, you know, let's see what happens. Looks like the community's starting to get uh, out of the COVID dundrums and moving into some productive building here. Anyone else? Seeing no other hands, all those in favor? Any opposed? None opposed, motion carries. We'll move on to the public performance code of conduct that council approved the public performance oops, code of conduct policy is presented in the June 21st, 2021 report by the executive coordinator. If I can get a mover and a seconder and would anyone like to speak to it from staff? Uh, I can, your worship. Or your okay. Um, so a uh, couple of years ago now, we had been having some discussions with the DBIA and uh, Summer Festival Society around having a code of conduct uh, policy for uh, public performances uh, as we, from time to time, not very frequently, but receive complaints regarding um, undesirable acts or, or behavior around the public events. Um, so we felt that would be useful to provide some overarching guidelines for the performers and uh, they are attached for your consideration. Also, we've talked about from an implementation perspective, it's not noted in the report where we're looking at, in order to streamline it for um, for the performers to be able to acknowledge receipt of it, uh, having a, an online form that they can fill out, uh, click a box and it'll uh, digitally submit it as opposed to having a, a lot of paperwork uh, that the um, event coordinators would have to handle. All right, thank you. And I saw Councillor Duncan's hand, I believe. Yes, thank you, uh, Madam Mayor. Um, so are there other uh, municipalities or cities that have a code like this? Where did you get the sort of background information to come up with the, the, the draft policy we have here? Thanks. Uh, much of it actually came from some policies that the uh, Summer Festival Society had themselves. There's not a lot of uh, other municipalities. Um, so I, I know staff did a bit of research, but I would say the vast majority don't have any um, public performance guidelines? Anyone else? No? Okay, seeing no other questions, I'm gonna call the question, all those in favor? Any opposed? Motion carries. And we will move on to Development Permit Variance Application, College Street Modular Daycare, that Council directs staff to issue the public notice required for the Development Permit for the Variances DVP 2021-01 for 1040 College Street is detailed in the June 21st, 2021 report of the Director of Public Works and Engineering and the Manager of Planning for a Modular Daycare Building. Do I have a mover and a seconder and a staff person to speak to this? Would that be... Uh, I Who's believe Brian was going to, but his internet's uh, maybe a little bit spotty, so I can I can give a once over and uh, Ms. Janot sure. can, can chime if if she likes. Uh, uh, generally speaking, we were aware that the school district was uh, planning on putting a modular daycare building at the back of the property. On uh, I should be sharing my screen is what I should be doing right now, uh, but I can't because I'm not set up for it. Um, I'm not. Um, it, hopefully, the drawings are relatively clear. Um, so at the north uh, west corner of the property, it's on College Street itself. It's actually a separate parcel associated with the Duncan Elementary School, the old Duncan Elementary School. And uh, the but just just very recently, we received uh, some information that they they were hoping for some variances for some of the development costs. <clears throat> and generally speaking, uh, we're just checking in to confirm your general interest in provi possibly providing these variances uh, as the uh, application didn't come in, <clears throat> excuse me, early enough uh, for us to give the notice of the variances prior to your consideration of that. Uh, normally, we would take the application, process it, and put it out for uh, uh, notice uh, beforehand. But given that the school districts has an interest in, in getting started um, early in August, I think, um, 
we, we, we really felt we should check in and see if there's some general support from council on, on providing this notice in the, and the application or the variances generally. Uh, staff generally support the variances. Um, the question ultimately may be that council may want to require that they construct a sidewalk and a crosswalk to the west side. Um, there's no sidewalk at all on the, on the east side of the street. So it, it makes little sense to create a sidewalk to nowhere. However, um, in, ex, in sort of uh, as a condition of, of the variance um, for, for the various works and services, a uh, council could consider at your next meeting, not necessarily today, uh, whether you may want to have uh, them be required to, to construct the sidewalk across the street. And that's what's referenced as a possibility within the, in the report. Excellent, thank you. Are there any questions from Council? Uh, Councillor Duncan, go ahead. And then Councillor Newington. Um, so they want us to waive uh, almost $30,000 in fees. Uh, is, is that what I'm, uh, you know, I looked, looked this over and um, it, it is the school district, but I don't think that we've we've done anything in the past where we've waived a bunch of fees for the school district. Perhaps we have. Maybe my memory's you know fading as as I get uh, to those retirement years. But um, I'm curious: have we ever granted this sort of uh, uh, variance to them in the past? And I, I you know I think that uh, if they're this is you know they're going to end up having people from not all the people from Duncan are going to be going there. So I'm. I've got some concern that we're putting quite a bit of money into variances, uh, if that's the case here. Um, Mr. Diverti? Yeah, if I may. Um, no, I don't believe uh, in my time with the city, we've had an application from the school district directly, as uh, we don't have a lot of school board properties within the, the municipality. But um, a similar example might be the, um, the hospice uh, on the corner of... Um, uh, Cavell and uh, and Karen's more so further down the street where there were portions of uh, of the works and services bylaw that were varied by council in order to uh, reduce the cost. A lot of the works and services uh, bylaw requirements are uh, sort of the starting point of of uh, development costs with respect to um, you know paving to the center line of the road and and so on and so forth. And so similar to the the hospice where. There was a review of the pavement condition and determined that in this that particular case, not all of the pavement would require removal. Uh, so in this case, as uh, detailed in the in the table there, oh, Councillor Middlemas is in the waiting room for some reason. Hold on a second. Okay, she's back. Uh, so in the in the table, uh, staff has um, detailed what the rationale perhaps for why, um, why you might want to consider. And, and of course, you're not necessarily considering for sure today. If, if uh, council, for example, did not want to consider any variances whatsoever, then there's no need to give us a uh, direction to give a notice. You, you can simply say, no, let's not move forward to that step. If, if you want to think about it further and, and the potential for all or some of those uh, to be varied, then, uh, then you'd give approval for us to give notice and uh, we, we would do that. And then you'd ultimately consider that at your meeting in July. Uh, Councillor, is it a follow-up, Councillor Duncan? Does Councillor yep. Newington a follow-up? Okay, go ahead. Well, the hospice, I don't know if the, the, it's a fair comparison. And I believe the hospice is a, you know, a charitable society uh, and uh, the school district has you know, significant funds behind them uh, I really am not supportive of any of these variances. Uh, if they want to make, uh, you know, bring in the daycare, uh, which will probably result in some income to them, I think they have to pay their way. Uh, so I don't support any of these variances. Councilor Newington? Um, no, thank you. My question got answered, so I'm good. Okay, is there any other questions or comments from council right now? Seeing no hands. Oh, I, I think Councilor Bruce, is that your hand up? Yes, yes it is, thank you. Okay. Thank you. I, I'm, uh, I'm with Tom on that, or uh, with uh, Councilor Duncan on 
on that, on not giving any variances uh, and cost reductions to the school district for this proposal, as much as I'd like to see the proposal go ahead for sure, because we should certainly need the spaces. However, I believe also that the hospice is indeed a different kettle of fish compared to um, the school district. And I was very pleased to give the hospice society uh, their DCC variances. But uh, in this particular case, uh, I, I would say no to uh, giving any uh, variances for the school district. Thank you. Okay, anyone else? Councillor Caps. Thank you, um, Mayor Staples. I struggle with this a little bit. Um, I do think that is a lot to waive. Um, and I do, you know, I, I agree that perhaps it's not fair to directly relate that to the same sort of situation as hospice. But I do think that the childcare spaces are critically important. I remember when we got our last report about the childcare needs for the Valley, I think we were described as a childcare desert um, uh, and that we're severely lacking in, in daycares and in childcare spaces. And I wonder if there's some sort of compromise or a middle ground that we could come to. I would like to help make this happen, but I understand if that's uh, too steep for the rest of council to consider, but I really do want to support this. Okay, any other questions from council? Councilor Brooke, go ahead. Thank you, Mayor. So we, we don't, if we deny these uh, variances, uh, we don't know that they'll just hold their tent and go home. Uh, they're asking for these variances and, and they're, to be honest, not a particularly reasonable request and certainly not a reasonable request when you look at the applicant. Uh, you know, if, if it was a private individual putting some buildings up and you asked for those types of variances, which are just financial in nature, you, you wouldn't get it passed. It would, wouldn't go through. So I see, I see no reason to support this. The, Again, like uh, Councillor Bruce says, yes, I'm very much for the development of, of, uh, of this uh, uh, type of uh, daycare, but uh, no, I, I see no point in, uh, in uh, giving them variances of this, this dollar value. Anyone else? Councillor Duncan, go ahead. Uh, thank you. And yes, you know, I'm fully supportive of daycare. We need daycare. Uh, and, you know, I've been trying for uh, years on the community center to see if we could get something in there and we haven't been able to. But, you know, the, if the school board is undertaking this project, I think they have to pay their, pay their way just like any other developer would. Anyone else? Can, or, go ahead, Peter. Mr. Uh, Diverti, I, I mean. just want to provide an option to open. 100% uh, council's uh, prerogative to go either way. Uh, just wanted to to highlight a couple of the staff notes. One was uh, with respect to the sanitary main upgrade. That's a, a, a financial contribution towards the future replacement of the sanitary main in that area. And the staff noted that there's no immediate replacement project plan for that sewer main. And uh, as uh, detailed again within the report that there's the potential option for sidewalk improvements across the street rather than just the frontage uh, in front of their property directly that where the sidewalk would go to nowhere. Um, some combination of waivers uh, from council uh, with the condition of, of other improvements, whether it's sidewalk across the street, might, um, might provide an overall benefit to the street as opposed to sticking with the works and services bylaw uh, verbatim. So just, just to put that option out there for you to consider. Um, so there's that there's that additional possibility. Councillor Duncan, go ahead. Thank you. Um, so I'm trying to look through here and determine this appears to be a for-profit uh, uh, enterprise. Is that correct? Uh, I I can't speak precisely to that. I believe it's primarily a relocation of the one that's currently on Cairnsmore. The I believe it's growing together. It's a uh, I wouldn't say predominantly these are for profit. I believe the school board was successful in getting a bunch of uh, uh, grant fundings to put these in place. 
on their properties, uh, typically they're mandated then to um, lease at cost. Not, it's not a, I don't believe it's a money-making venture for the school district. They're mandated to provide, um, make their properties available for childcare. So I, I still have some concerns around what, what if another childcare pl place comes forward and says, well, I want 30 grand worth of uh, variances too. So that I really feel that we're setting up a uh, precedent here that I don't want to set. So I, I do have to vote against it. I know that we need the childcare spaces, but uh, I think the school board has to take on these costs themselves. So um, I'm going to get to Councillor Roos in a second. I just looked up if it is growing together. It is a nonprofit licensed group daycare. So um, I just wanted to put that out there. I feel like in what this is lacking for me is, is information. I feel like mm. I need more than what the school, what the, what's, what's here. And based on what I'm hearing from council, um, it, it says here to facilitate the development and remain within the Ministry of Children and Family Development project budget. That's why the request is coming in. But I feel like there's some missing sort of pieces that would really help flesh the, out the understanding of this, um, this project. So I just want to put that out there. Um, so Councillor Newington and then Councillor Bruce. Yeah, um, so um, building on what you said, Peter, or sorry, Mr. Diversheid, was that you think that it might be growing together, moving to that new location. So these are not new daycare spots. Uh, again, that, that's, I, I don't know if I have confirmation of that. Uh, Ms. Janot, do you recall specifically if these are new or if it's a relocation, if it's increased from what Growing Together has right now? Is it in fact Growing Together that's moving? I, I, I just have what's in front of me and a bit of uh, general recollection of some of the staff discussions. Um, it is Growing Together that's moving from Cairnsmore Street to this location and they've been hoping to do so for a long time um, as their, their existing structures are quite aged and uh, requiring a lot of upgrades to keep running in those structures. Um, I'm not sure though, I don't have it right in front of me, what their enrollment numbers are and whether they will be increasing it with this new uh, building. Okay, so um, yeah, I would like to have that information before I, I vote on this one way or the other, um, because to me, we're um, if it, if they're not creating a bunch of new daycare spots, I'm not ready to give a, up thirty thousand dollars of taxpayers' money. Thank you, um, Mr. Divertai. Uh, just um, again, the the decision to issue public notice um, doesn't mean you're deciding. To do it. It just means that you're willing to consider more information at this point, inclu including public uh, comment on, on the variance itself from the neighborhood in particular. Um, so it, that might give an opportunity for the school board to come forward with further information that might help clarify for you or, or might help uh, solidify uh, what, what I'm hearing, uh, some, some concern around uh, supporting it from a cost perspective. Um, so it, the, the decision to move forward with giving notice is just that it's a it's it's we're willing to hear more about it and uh, and uh, and consider it at our at our next meeting. So 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 essentially, we're not approving any of the variances. It's just true. simply the public notice only that we're so that we there can be more discussion on everything that we've talked about so far. Agreed. Yeah. And more. Okay. So that is the that is the motion on the table is just to issue the public notice, not for the the actual variances themselves. Correct. Okay, so with um, with that, is there any further discussion? So this is just for the public notice, not to approve the variances. Councillor Duncan, go ahead. You're on mute. Thank you. I really don't wanna go down the road of providing public notice when I can't feel like that I can support this at all. So, you know, I, I uh, especially if it's not even creating new new spaces, so I don't I don't think it's a good idea to put out public notice, and then we're going to have to field a bunch of questions, staff time over something that let's see whether or not we actually support giving thirty thousand dollars worth of variance. You know, but, so yes, certainly. 
if I if I may, um, in in, in a, I don't I don't mean to do a back and forth, but uh, I probably maybe didn't explain uh, very well. Is there there's some items that based on the Works and Services bylaw that might not be as beneficial as other items on the street. For example, a, a, a crosswalk across to a sidewalk that actually connects to another sidewalk. If if the Works and Services bylaw um, is uh, is stuck to verbatim, uh, there will be a sidewalk in front of uh, this development, but it won't go to anywhere and there wouldn't be a crosswalk unless the council was to, or the city was to uh, build that across the street and a crosswalk to it. So there might be uh, overall benefit to considering it and and making some amendments that um, that maybe help the school district or maybe not, maybe just results in a better development for the street. So at this point, I'm really hearing from sort of, I believe what I'm hearing from most of council so far is, is that we need more information and we'd like more information. And we do have another meeting in approximately two weeks. Is that correct? I think it's three. Uh, it's the 19th, I believe, of July. The 19th of July. Um, so it sounds like there may be an appetite to refer this to that meeting with the request for more information that council has asked for. Is that the sense that I'm getting from council? I, I see nodding. Councillor Caps, did you add your hand up? Go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Um, Mayor Staples, I would be supportive of that and referring it to that meeting um, rather than going ahead with the notice just so that we have another chance to discuss this. There's a lot of information that I've heard everyone say they wish that they had. Um, so I personally would be supportive of that opportunity to discuss it further. Okay, so is there a seconder for that? Okay, so we're all, it's a motion to refer to the next meeting requesting more information from both the school district and it sounds like the organization and, and possibly as well some more information from um, from public works and engineering. Is that sum up what I'm hearing? Yes, I see nodding. Okay. Any further discussion on that? Seeing none, I'll call the question. All those in favor? Any opposed? So, okay, thank you. Let me ask a clarifying question. So that's to have it come back for consideration at the July meeting with further information. Um, mm -hmm. But just for clarity, if 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 council doesn't give direction at this meeting now to give the notice, you won't be able to consider the variance whatsoever on in July, and you won't then be able to consider that till August, and they'll be either moving ahead with it as constructed, uh, or as as uh, required by the Works and Services, or um, yeah, I guess they'll just have to move ahead. Because the, the, the answer from council at that point would be somewhat too late because um, they won't have enough time for you to consider the variance until August. So it's up to you. I'm just saying you, you by deferring it, that you, you really should still give the notice so that you can still defer the decision and have that uh, with the further information that you've requested by, by the, the 19th of July. And then we would also have public input from that at yeah. the same time to consider? Okay, Councillor Duncan. I just want to clarify one more time. It doesn't mean by giving notice, you can still require $30,000 worth of works. Could be the works that are in the works and services bylaw, could be different works that make more sense for the, the area. That's, I'll just leave it at that. I've said that a couple of times, but. Councillor Duncan. If their whole business plan is hinged on us giving uh, $30,000 worth of variances, that's not a very good plan and they better come forward with some more information. Uh, you know, I'm just not prepared to turn over, you know, turn over and give them $30,000 worth of variances when there seems to be a lot of questions. So I don't want to start down the road of giving the notice, Mr. Divertai. Okay. Anyone else? Okay. So we are moving on. And we will go to bylaws for adoption, housing agreements, 361 St. Julian Street, the council adopt the housing agreement, bylaw number 3216-2021, a bylaw to authorize a housing agreement. Do I have a mover and a seconder for this? Is there any discussion from staff or anything staff would like to speak to on this? Uh, no change to the um, to what, what was discussed at uh, council last uh, 
last meeting. Okay. Any further questions from council? Seeing none, all those in favor? Motion carries. 8.2, that council adopt Queens Garden Apartments Inc. Incorporated housing agreement bylaw number 3217-2021, a bylaw to authorize a housing agreement, Queen Garden Apartments, Queen's Garden Apartments. Do I have a mover and a seconder for this? Is there anything that staff would like to speak to to this? Uh, <clears throat> there were no further changes to this bylaw other than what council approved at the last meeting, just the change that rather than the owner having to supply the entire housing agreement to each tenant that they um, supply information on the housing agreement in a summarizing document. <clears throat> Thank you. Any other, any questions? Seeing none, all those in favor? Any opposed? Motion carries. Proclamation, we don't have any proclamations tonight, I don't believe. Um, and we'll move on to reports of mayor and council. Are there any council members who'd like to make a report? Seeing no hands. Nope. Okay. And I just want to announce that we officially became um, the Vancouver, Vancouver Island's first B city. Congratulations for all the work. And I hope you all read the email um, that was sent from the, uh, from the, the B city Canada and how impressed they were with everything that the city is already doing. Um, I've already attended a, a first forum that was uh, presented by QMS on speaking about bees. So we've already achieved one of our goals for next year. And so thanks everyone for your work on that. It's very exciting. Um, and they liked the, our slogan, but I don't think they realized it was our city slogan about the small town big bees. <laughs> um, Councillor Newington, go ahead. Thank you. I just also wanted to um, let everybody know to come and visit the booth at the Duncan Market on the weekend. Um, the City of Duncan and the Couch and Beekeepers will be having a booth and we'll actually have bees down there that you can hopefully find the queen and uh, giving out information on pollinators and um, all that sort of stuff. So come on down Excellent. and visit. thank you. Yes, and that's number two of the events for, <laughs> um, but I just also wanted to say, just if, if um, you haven't read the letter yet, um, the response yet, just how much work that the city is actually already doing. And so I just wanna congratulate the staff for everything that, that is already happening around taking care of pollinators within the city um, and the parks. So thank you. Look forward to, to engaging the community more in the future about this. Uh, do we have any questions? tonight have any has anything come in no okay then we'll move into closed session that the meeting be closed to the public under the following sections of the community charter to discuss matters related to employee relations section 91c labor relations or other employee relations legal advice section 91 the receipt of advice that is subject to solicitor client privilege including communications necessary for that purpose provision of a municipal service section 91k negotiations and related discussions respecting the proposed provision of a municipal service that are in their preliminary stages and that in the view of council could be reasonably expected to harm the interests of the municipality if they were held in public and information held in confidence, section 92B, the consideration of information received and held in confidence relating to negotiations between the municipality and a provincial government or the federal government or both or between provincial government or the federal government or, um, or both and a third party. Do I have a mover and a seconder for that? And all those in favor? Okay, it's 8.38. Let's meet at 8.45 in Zoom, in our closed Zoom. We'll see you there. <laughs>